So what you do here and what you learn out of here is really, really important. And uh, whether it's the water issue or the energy issue or Iraq, Afghanistan, all the different things we have, this is part of your life. You know, this is what you're moving into. And you just can't help but have a great deal of confidence for the way you've handled yourself, the questions you've asked, not only now, but for the 21 previous we've had, what we're going to do, because all these people up here could, could just do a great job for another three or four hours each. We don't have that time. What we would like is you to get up, state your question, and instead of everybody jumping in, I'll, we'll use a congressional rule, the, the two-minute rule, and we'll just, you know, call them, call them in order. Unless there's somebody particular you want, and if you'd identify that, we'd follow that uh, procedure. Okay, all in favor, aye, aye, the ayes have it. That's one thing you got to learn as the chairman. You have certain rules of how to do things, and if you want to move something along, you can, you can do it that way. You can't get away with it too much, but, it, but once in a while you can move something. So who's got the first question? I take a marine science class at school, and my teacher, Mrs. Cott, likes to remind us every day about how we're running out of water, and it's going horrible for us in Florida, and how scary stuff's going to get in 20 years. And, um, and we studied desalinization, or whatever it is, and um, I know Miss Barnett, who spoke earlier, spoke of the Tampa Bay, uh, I don't know what it was, it was like a big... Uh, <laughs> the South plant. Yeah, and um, how it's uh, not cost effective, there's a bunch of technical errors, they didn't do their job, and me coming into this, I guess I'm, I was uninformed, I thought, you know, if there's 98% of the world's water, or however much it is, is salt water, if we could... Uh, take out salt on a massive scale, wouldn't that be uh, a solution? And my question to you guys would be, since you guys are experts, is there any uh, possibility in the future that we could do something like that and in in, in take advantage of th these oceans that we have and all this salt water? Because, I mean, maybe it's just me being uh, a little naive or something, but there's all this salt water, and if there's a process that we know works to take salt out of it, you know, I would take jump in quickly. That on a huge there's, scale? there's some called ocean thermal energy, which happened to be my legislation that we passed and was done in Hawaii, where they literally took the difference of the water temperature in the ocean and created power. And uh, the uh, the work on it stopped when the price of oil fell. But that's well. There's also solar desalination experimentation going on in the Middle East, and and that perhaps holds great promise. Um, it was President Kennedy who said if we could figure out how to inexpensively um, extract fresh water from the sea, that would be one of the greatest things we could do for, for mankind to, to halt global water shortages. The, the issue I talked about with desalinization is the fact that the unintended consequence is these really high energy costs, energy demands, and carbon emissions. And so certainly um, the, the promise of solar desalination is interesting. And I think for Florida, the issue is, do we really need to spend that much money on a still uncertain technology when we haven't picked all the low-hanging fruit? Don't na naval uh, ships in the US Navy do uh, that? I'm not sure how they do it. What's the difference between that way and solar desalinization and stuff like that? The Navy ships do desalinate as well, and I don't want to hog all the de desalinate uh, time. Does someone else want to? Melissa, do you want to comment on any, anything you guys have going on into <clears throat> desal research? Yeah, I just, to, just very briefly, you are exactly right. Um, there are a lot of very practical applications for desalination. Um, I think one of the traps that we run into in the state of Florida is is looking to the Tampa Bay example, um, which had just, it wasn't a good, it's not a good example for us to use. There were a lot of contractual issues and a lot of places where they stumbled. Um, there are other examples around the country. Carlsbad is a perfect example, um, which is a project that's getting off the ground right now. It's It's set up in a very different financial way, a very different ecological way. It took 10 years to go through the permitting um, just to make sure that it was done in an environmentally friendly way. So I think we're going to see in the country um, some uh, advan technological advances which are going to show us that desal can be more cost effective and can be done in an environmentally friendly way. 
Uh, we do have challenges. I think you're going to see desalination plants propose themselves next to uh, power generation plants, probably nuclear plants, um, so that they can get some efficiencies uh, in terms of sharing energy and how that works in terms of water and uh, just trying to be more efficient. So I think you're going to see the industry try to become more environmentally friendly, more green, um, which will be very helpful. You go over to the Middle East, that's all they use. Um, I've been over there. It's very economically feasible. They don't have a lot of options, though, which makes it economically feasible. And, so I think it's... And, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please finish. I th <laughs> just... As the industry itself gets better, the price uh, per gallon is, you know, how we price things will get better um, and the uh, processes will get more efficient. I think, uh, I think Cynthia's right. It's just not our low hanging fruit right now and we have other things that we can do like conservation where we don't have to go to that extreme yet. Um, I think we should follow the industry. I think we can use it um, in certain places. It may be more efficient than in others. Uh, the Keys, right now we have a pipeline which pipes water from Florida City, Homestead, all the way down to Key West. That's how they get their fresh water. Is that the most efficient way? What happens if that pipe gets broken on the way down? Maybe a desal plant down in Key West is the best approach for them. You know, these kinds of things are just discussions as we look at return on investment and how we look at things and um, as we move forward in terms of water supply. I was wondering, uh, each of you are talking about uh, how, uh, what we should do uh, to kind of like uh, save the water. What are you guys doing personally, like uh, maybe in your homes or like uh, just around the community? What are you guys doing, uh, like individually? Who, why don't we start that in the far end, Rob? You want to talk about playing baseball in between doing all that? <laughs> I have no grass. I don't irrigate my, my yard. I have a total, total, um, it's just tree, trees in front. That's what I do personally. At OUC, we have um, some very proactive education programs that are to all fifth graders for energy and water conservation. Um, that, that rolls out and people learn about our natural resources and, and water and energy. We are um, doing a bunch of, we pay money for using less water. The, the thing, single thing you can do in your home right now that saves the most energy is a, a heat pump water heater. They cost three times the amount, but you'll pay, pay your, um, you get a payback in savings in two or three years. There's that kind of technology. Jeff, you want to take a shot at it? Ditto. But I will say, I after my own heart. <laughs> but I, I will say, I chase my kids out of the shower after five or so minutes. Uh, <laughs> shorter showers, everybody. <laughs> oh. Join the Navy, you know, and that, that gets you through pretty quick. <laughs> what else out there? You want to say? Yeah. You want me to say? Okay. Um, I filled up all of my uh, grass with sand, so I have a beach volleyball court. Um, I have no grass. I, uh, I pulled out the, uh, uh, all of the, uh, in the front yard, which I do have grass, I, I put different grass up there that needs less water, and then I allow our wonderful rain to go ahead and take care of it so I have no irrigation. I pulled out that entire system when I bought the house. Um, I have uh, conservation uh, uh, toilets, the ones that use less water. I have solar energy water heater. I have a solar energy to heat the swimming pool. Um, I could go on, but uh, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of things that you'd be surprised you can do to save it. The thing that I'm most proud of, though, when I was mayor of the city of Altamont Springs, we put in a system for the entire city of Altamont Springs called Project Apricot. It is a dual pipe system which takes the reclaim, which takes the water that you use uh, in the yard and the um, uh, and, and washing cars and other things, only uh, cleans it up a little bit and uses it for reclaimed water, and it saves more than three billion gallons of water a year. As we noticed earlier, only three people w uh, rose their hands when the question was asked about how many people exactly are going to have a career in environmental protection or environment in general, right? Um, how do you think we can inspire our generation in general to, like, to be more active and pursue this, um, this field more tenaciously, so to speak, or whatever? Because um, 
we're we're new to this, I guess. Like, how, what do you think we should do to like, or what? Can I take this? How are we going to be more informed and inspired to do this? You know, like read Cynthia's books. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I took the pamphlet and book she wrote, and I took it home and read it. I read about four times, and it's not very long, but it. it verbalized or I, a lot of my thinking in terms of it. Do you want to comment on that? Or who's think, Jeff? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, think. Uh, let me, I, I want to take this because, you know, the, one of the things that, that has influenced all of us the most when we were younger is our parents. What influences the most of you now is your friends. And I have seen, I've seen a friend who believes in the environment, totally convince another friend to quit throwing the trash out the, out, you know, I mean, these are all interrelated, but quit throwing trash, uh, you know, as you walk or in, if you're in the car or something like that. Um, I, I, you know, or, or when they see somebody wasting water or they see somebody doing anything that is environmentally uh, um, um, wrong, I'll use that word. You each can influence one another so much because of the peer pressure that you, that you all face on everything right now. And, and this is one of them. And if it, it becomes that protecting the environment is cool, um, you know, I mean, it's, it, it changes a lot of things. One of the things that uh, Mr. Prather and I have been very much involved in, uh, I'm still chairman of the Wakaiva uh, Commission. He is uh, on the Wakaiva Commission. We're building that road to complete the beltway around Central Florida. But when, when, when we were doing that in the very beginning, in 2004, a 12-year-old little girl, 12-year-old little girl, would come to every meeting as we were trying to put together the legislation, 28-person panel. It must have just been intimidating to her, but she would get up there every single time. And, and she had written a letter to us every single time telling us how important it was that we protected that river. You all have a great deal of influence. Let me tell you something else. As much as your parents had influence on you, if you watch your mom or dad do something that is also environmentally and you tell them that, God, that embarrasses them. And they won't do it again, and you look pretty cool and pretty smart, don't you? So you control your own destiny right now. You do, and you will control the next generation's destiny because you're going to be the moms and the dads in just a few years. One of the things that uh, Mr. Prather also indicated to me that I went out, I would encourage your communities and your school districts to get you know, science and environmental classes. We have done that at the city of Altamont Springs where we actually take students from middle school and high school into one of our parks and over to one of the, big, one of the tributaries of the Wakaiva River and actually show them and explain to them the science of how we can pr protect that river. And, and field trips that I'm sure many of you have been on, you're on one today, but field trips uh, going actually into those lakes, river streams, uh, and, their, and, and their wetlands um, contribute so much to your understanding and education of the system. But I have a question for you. I know you have been to Singapore, I think I, we heard you say. Um, I know you're representatives of Florida, but is it just as bad elsewhere around the world, as bad as here in Florida? Or is it, do you think it's worse here, just in Florida, and a little bit of the, more of the United States? <clears throat> I think that's a great question. Um, Florida has had a reputation for having among some of the most progressive water management in the United States beginning in the 1970s, in the early 70s when we created the water management districts in 1972 and so on. It has been losing the reputation in just the past few years. Um, some of the other states um, I talked about some of the progressive things going on, for example, with stormwater management in Atlanta. Um, I was in Oklahoma a few months ago. That's the first state in the nation that's written into its state water plan. We will use less water 50 years from now than we do today with, with growth and, and with uh, economic and population growth. These are all um, so, uh, so it's a mixed answer. We, we have had very progressive water management and a, and a great 
um, staff of water scientists in Florida. So the important thing is to keep that going in the, in the future and also to not be arrogant about that. I, I have sometimes heard people say in Florida, oh, we're the best. People, people from Australia have come here to see how we do it. We don't need to know how they do it somewhere else. But of course, we all uh, need to be open-minded about the best practices everywhere. So we certainly don't have the problems of, of Africa or, or some of the most water-stressed parts of the world. And I, I don't know if someone else might want to weigh in. I'm the, I'm the outsider on the panel, so one of the insiders might like to answer. We'll, we'll start by the bottom far side of the panel. You're right. Singapore has some very progressive practices. Some, some engineers came and, and toured some of our facilities. What I thought was fascinating about Singapore was they have cl different classifications of water for, like, their chillers. You cannot use potable water or high quality water, they call, it has to be reused water. And they have double decking because land is at a premium. So they have different classifications of water for some of their chill water systems and, and it, they go to extraordinary lengths to recycle and recycle the water and they have different terms for some of the water and it's very progressive. How many of you, if we ask you right now, would agree to put a two cent tax on uh, all tourist activities to be used for, for water. The tourist tax, yeah, everybody would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said tourist. I, I, know, everybody I, I didn't fall off a turnip truck. So, I, how many of you uh, are against it? Anybody against it? What if we make it a four cent? Okay, ten cents. Uh, seriously, so you, you would be willing to put some money on a bill as long as it was in a fund that would go only to help water research? Uh, yeah, is that, how bad an idea is that? Bill, bill you're down the end. Would, would you like me to start? I, I think the interesting conversation maybe is would Florida be willing to charge a little something for water extracted. For example, environmentalists are often saying we should tax the bottled water industry, but maybe everyone who takes an amount of water from the aquifer should have to pay a little something, because if they did, that would yeah, automatically it, uh, it, it create would a lot right? of conservation. Jeff, how about you? Well, I think any way you can generate some seed money, uh, going back to the city of Altamont Springs, they just uh, getting ready to do an I-4 widening project there. Uh, DOT, instead of just putting in a traditional big hole for uh, stormwater, uh, is actually going to be doing a project that's going to take that stormwater, augment their reclaimed water. Uh, all that reclaimed water will now become a commodity. They're going to send it to a neighboring city, the city of Apopka, so they can use it in their uh, reclaimed water lines, which is going to which is going to keep the city of Apopka from having to withdraw water from the aquifer. How smart is that? And then at the same time, it's going to eliminate discharges into the Little Wakaiva River. Uh, no longer is stormwater going to go when there's too much stormwater going into Little Wakaiva River, and the city of Altamont Springs will not have to discharge any excess reuse water that they have into Little Wakaiva. I think those are the types of projects that are going to be coming. Uh, hopefully many of them, I think, having that seed money to help get those things generated is important. Um, I, I want you to all, re all remember there's a theme there. I'm very proud of the fact that I was mayor of Altamont Springs. They're all going from Altamont Springs here. Um, but there are certain cities, and I mean this, governments and cities that have done the right thing. And, and you asked a very good question about, you know, um, are there innovative approaches going other places? Florida did have, and Cynthia was absolutely correct, a great reputation. One of the things that we need to maintain, perception becomes reality. I said in my speech that, you know, people moving down here is the real economy of Florida. And if we don't do that while having that smart growth, while having sustainability and the things that we need to do, 
um, you know, people stop coming. So we have to maintain that perception that we are doing a better job in addition to the fact that we have a very sensitive, um, uh, you know, we live on a body of water in Florida known as the aquifer, and we better darn well protect it. And it does cause, you know, uh, uh, sinkholes when we do take water out of there. So, I mean, it's all interrelated. We don't, and, and to get to your question, uh, you know, there's a diminishing return. Um, I, you know, you've got to be very careful. We're already taking uh, tourist tax dollars and using it to build facilities already that will bring people down on sports facilities and other things like that. So first and foremost, we need to tax, if you want to use that word, and none of us like using that word, but if we're going to do anything, we need to have what we call user fees. The people that use the water pay for the water. Makes perfect sense to me. And one of the things that's going to happen is, is that uh, and, and the, you know, the economy of scale is going to occur that when it costs us more to extract that water, clean that water, it's going to go up, as I said. And that is going to be the best way that we're going to uh, uh, conserve. When, the money, when water costs as much as, um, you know, bottled water uh, costs a dollar or more a bottle. You know I mean? Like, you can get the same water. There was just a story in the newspaper. You can get the same water out of a tap. You can keep the bottle, put the water in, and use it over again. I mean, that's, that's something that would protect a lot of it, uh, a lot of uh, also recycling, if you wanted to call it that way, so. Well, um, I was uh, curious, you said the tipping point, or the point, we, we're not at the point yet where we have to use desalinization. When do we know that we've hit that point, or like when? When, the tick when you get salt water out of your yeah. <laughs> that, salt water yeah, intrusion. Kind of a problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Who? I, what, what I, yeah. yeah, I, I got it. Go ahead. The, what people have to remember, it's very appealing to, to look at all this water and say, boy, I'd like to make that fresh. To do a desal plant, it requires the construction of three plants. You have to pre treat the water, it depends on the salinity. You have to have membranes to take the salts out, and then you have to deal with the concentrate. So you're building three plants to desalinate the water. It's very energy intensive. The in innovation that we're, we're looking for and, and to attract people to the, the field is the, in the energy water nexus. We're looking to do it cheaper. We're looking to financially innovate. We're looking for regulations. There's some pending laws that are coming up on water quality credit training. We're trying to restore the old Senate Bill 444 funds that were there that was an environmental trust fund to be just like transportation and fund some of these things that we want to pay for. So we need to financially innovate. We have to look for reducing energy creatively and not, not look at, at doing it with more energy, but figuring out how to do it with less energy. And then you guys are all digital wizards we monitor and do it, do it smarter. Well, we have come uh, to the end, I think, of a wonderful program uh, on September the 30th. <laughs> on, uh, on September 30th, we're going to have our 22nd symposium. It's going to be in simulation, drones, cyber, cyber security. <laughs> And it's going to be devoted to high tech in Florida and some issues which I'm afraid will still be very much uh, in the spotlight. So thank you very much. You've, as usual, been just a great bunch. And have a great, great, great speakers. <laughs>